Hi, my name's Maria Tabane and uh, in this class we're going to be looking at the laryngeal states, um, which is the states of the larynx. Um, so really this is the starting point of speech, I suppose. Um, so, you know, rem air, you know, comes from the lungs um, and in linguistics we just sort of take it that that happens um, quite happily. Uh, speech pathologists might have to worry about how that happens a lot more, but in linguistics we don't worry about that. Um, we only start to worry, you know, when the air starts to hit the larynx. So we're going to look at the different states of the larynx and how that um, then influences what happens uh, above the larynx. All right, um, or the different consonant and vowel sounds. Okay, so um, air is coming up from the lungs and the, the larynx is quite a complex structure. Okay, it's, um, it's got lots of, you know, ligaments and, and cartilages um, and, and voice is a whole area of specialty in speech. But in linguistics we really just worry about a very small number of states in the larynx um, where the space between the vocal folds, which are one of the pairs of um, ligaments in the uh, larynx, whether the vocal folds are open or closed. And we're going to be in this class looking at the different stages um, between open and closed, particular ideal points um, that linguists like to identify. Um, so let's just go with the most basic to start with, um, which is what we call voicing, uh, regular modal voicing, ideal voicing in linguistics. Um, so the air is coming up from the lungs and the vocal folds, which are just a small part of the larynx, they're really tiny, um, you know, really very, very small. Um, I think of them a bit like an elastic band, to be honest, a small, <laughs> a small, a small elastic band. Um, and, and the air is coming up from the lungs and it pushes those vocal folds apart. Okay, what we're doing here is we're sort of looking down from above um, at the larynx and there's a, a gap, the vocal folds are being pushed apart. Now that gap in the middle there is called the glottis. The glottis is just the space between the vocal folds. It has a special name, okay? The space between the vocal folds is called the glottis, all right? Um, so the air has pushed those vocal folds apart and then um, at a certain point the pressure below the glottis, below the vocal folds, below the larynx, is not greater than the pressure above the larynx, okay? And what happens then is the little tissues, the little muscles just, the vocal folds snap back together, okay? So they've, they've been pushed apart by the air pressure beneath the larynx as the air is coming from the lungs, and then they come back together. And that keeps happening, okay? Um, they, they sort of snap back together, pushed apart, come together, pushed apart, come together, all right? Um, you don't need to know this, but this is known as the myoelastic, um, aerodynamic myoelastic theory of speech production. I'll rub that out. Aerodynamic myoelastic, okay? So aerodynamic means that it's just coming from um, the air pressure underneath and the myoelastic is referring to the fact that the, the little muscles, little tissues, it, it's elastic and they are little like rubber bands and they come back together. Alright, so like I say, we don't really need to worry about that too much here. Um, so that's how what we call modal voicing happens and um, in linguistics, I'll just put this over here maybe, over on this side, we'll say that these are um, voiced sounds. I'll put this in the stage midway between open and closed. So these are voiced sounds, okay, um, and it would be most, the vowels, vowels in an ideal situation, um, most vowels are just plain voiced. So I'm going to be a little bit cheeky here and I'm going to um, write, not, not strict IPA, um, International Phonetic Alphabet, I'm just going to write um, this as a low central vowel, okay. It's not strictly the correct symbol, but that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so any vowel is voiced. Ah, and if you put your fingers on your throat in front of your larynx, ah, you will feel the vibrations there. 
And um, another really good way to feel the vibrations is uh, maybe it works better with um, another sound. Um, if we do the sound zzz, zzz, you should hear a real buzzing in your ear. Whereas if you um, do a um, letter S for Sierra, you can't hear a buzzing. You should feel a real buzzing and you should feel a difference in you should feel the vibrations here okay so um, so this is uh, the difference between what we call voiced sounds and what we call what I just did then with was voiceless sounds okay I might that a little bit lower otherwise I'm gonna run out of space I think um, I'll pop it a bit lower there voiceless Voiced, voiceless. There we go. Okay, and so s is a consonant sound that is voiceless. Okay. Um, now, um, with voiceless sounds, we don't have the vocal folds um, vibrating. The vocal folds are held apart. Okay, they are actively held apart, just like, in fact, for voicing. They sort of have to be positioned in a certain state for the voicing to start, but um, they, they don't keep opening and closing actively, okay? The opening and closing for voicing happens, um, if you like, automatically, so long as the pressure below the glottis is um, greater than the pressure above the glottis, okay? So once the voicing starts, it sort of keeps going until the pressure difference um, is equalised. All right. But for voiceless consonants, the vocal folds are sort of actively held apart. All right. And that would be a sound like s. Um, and for vowels, um, you can have a voiceless vowel and we write it um, like this. We write a little, um, I'll get rid of the s there for now, these two. Um, for vowels, we write it with a little um, circle underneath, okay? And that's a voiceless vowel. And what does that sound like? <sighs> okay, it sounds a bit to you like what we call the glottal consonant H. Um, so, H is a glottal consonant. Um, so it's a consonant that is um, made by keeping the vocal folds apart, all right? It's not a true consonant in that sense, um, but I don't want to get into that sort of thing at the moment. Um, so basically a voiceless vowel sounds like the vowel that's coming after a letter H. So I could go and you'll probably know that I had the vowel um, air coming up or You'd know I had the vowel or oh, coming up, or oh, oh. you can guess what vowels coming up, okay? And those were all just little voiceless vowels, okay? Um, so vowels can be voiceless, um, but usually when we're talking about voicelessness, we're talking about consonants. And the prototypical, um, the voiceless consonants we normally think of are like p, t, k. Now I'm going to have to do some qualifications later on okay and um, so you should remember this hopefully uh, if you've done English phonetics that the voiceless consonants are voiceless stops sorry are p to k and the voiced ones are b d g okay so the voiced consonant in English is b okay um, so yeah um, that's that right now, we can have a special kind of um, extra voiceless consonant, and that is called an aspirated consonant. So I'll write that up here, aspirated. And you can get, um, and the way we write that 
is we put the little h after the relevant consonant. In this case, I'm just writing the bilabial stops, okay? Um, you can get aspirated fricatives. They're not really super common, okay? So, yeah, so I'm going to rub that out. Um, usually when we talk about aspirated, we're talking about aspirated um, stops, okay? Um, so, and that's just an extra puff of air because the vocal folds are being held extra far apart, okay? Um, and they, yeah, so for voiceless they're just held a little bit apart, but for aspirated they're really held extra far apart and what that means is more air has flowed through and you get a bigger puff of air, a pa, a pa, okay? This one, listen carefully, a ba, a ba. I'll come back to what that might be sounding like to you in a tick. And this is the proper voiced one, a ba, a ba, okay? You still get a puff, you, you still get a little bit of air, but it's not the same kind of puff as you get up here, a pa. And if you do the, the fingers on the throat, um, a pa, a ba, a ba. Only this one should have the really good voicing on the throat. Okay, um, and I can see once again that I've managed to um, run myself out of space. So I'm going to have to move this. I wasn't uh, measuring my space very well, so I'm just going to move the voice down a little bit because I've got to put something in the middle there. So um, I'll write the voice down here. So I had a uh and b there. Okay, so I'll just write those as, um, I'll do them in, oh, I'll do them in square brackets. Okay, like that. Okay. Um, the one I need to put in the middle here is uh, a special state that we talk about in linguistics called breathy voiced. Um, so it's in between voiced and voiceless. <laughs> so I'll just write that. Um, so that is, um, yeah, so that's, oh, no, I wanted to use a different colour. Um, I wanted to do it in blue. There we go. So breathy voiced here. There we go. Now, if we're talking about a breathy voiced vowel, um, unfortunately, we do this <laughs> with, um, I'm just going to check that I get this right, two little dots underneath, okay? On vowels, we do it with two little dots underneath. And on the consonants, we do it with um, a special symbol. Uh, it's an H with a hook on the top. I hope you can see that. I hope that's on the screen. I think it is. Okay. Um, and the way this sounds is ah, ah. So it's still got some voicing, but you can hear a lot of breath, a lot of air coming out. And here it is on the consonant, a ba, a ba. As usual in linguistics, I'm just sort of exaggerating this here. So with breathy voicing, we've got the voicing happening, all right, but it's not quite open, shut together, open, shut together. It's more like spending more time open, okay? It's, it's not quite shutting together, snapping together quite as much, all right? So it's got a much longer, what we call open um, period, open quotient. It's spending longer open and less time closed, comparatively less time closed, okay? Normally what happens in regular voicing, regular vocal fold vibration, and this one here is, we call this modal voicing, which is our ideal voicing, this is modal voicing, okay, ideal voicing, is they, they come apart and then they snap back together relatively quickly, okay, in regular voicing. But in breathy voicing, that snapping back doesn't really happen, okay? So there's a lot more air escaping through the vocal folds. Ah, and you can have a, like, um, some people have a very breathy speech. Um, uh, so you have a very breathy speech where there's just a lot of vocal fold, um, a lot of air coming through the vocal folds. It can be a permanent state, okay. It's a state that the um, speech pathologists don't like very much. Um, they consider it a bit inefficient. Um, and um, in, in linguistics, it's usually used in some languages to uh, distinguish um, uh, particular syllables or words from other syllables or words. So it might actually make a meaningful contrast whether you say um, 
ba or ba. Okay, so um, I, I won't get into the examples here. Um, they're certainly uh, available on the internet. But um, for instance, many Indian languages would have a distinction between um, breathy voiced consonants or vowels and regular plain voiced um, consonants or vowels. Um, so, okay, so there we are there. There is um, another uh, state that the speech pathologists aren't super keen on, but that we like to distinguish in linguistics. And that's called a creaky voice, okay? Um, and this is, uh, again, we've got slightly different notation there um, for the, um, the vowels. We um, just write it like this. Got a little tilde underneath, okay? Um, and um, we sort of have this distinction between breathy, modal voicing and creaky um, on vowels and also on like sonorant consonants like in nasals. So you can actually get um, breathy voiced or creaky voiced nasals um, like ma or na, okay? That's possible. Um, so not super common, but um, yeah. So, that, so this notation that's used on the vowels is also used um, on the sonorant consonants like the nasals. Um, and, and this kind of notation um, with the, the hooks, the uh, H with a hook and, and the plain H, that's used, more, that's used on the stops, okay? So there's just a slightly different um, tradition of how these um, voicings are uh, annotated. Okay, so um, yeah, and the, the creaky voice, um, it sounds, okay, sorry, back to creaky voice. It sounds, um, it sounds like this, okay, it's a very uh, distinctive voice quality. You tend to pick up on it pretty easily. Uh, and what happens in creaky voice is the vocal folds, uh, they come apart, but they snap back together very quickly. I'll stop doing that voice. <laughs> um, it, it, they, they go apart, but really come back together very, very quickly. Where's my, can you see my hands? Hang on, where are they? Cut apart, come back together quickly, apart, come back together quickly. So they, it's voiced, but the vocal folds spend a lot more time closed then open. So remember with breathy voice they spend a lot more time open and with um, uh, creaky voice they spend a lot more time closed. Um, so uh, creaky voice is a setting if, I don't know if you remember the Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke, he was known for having a very creaky voice quality. When it comes to breathy voice I think of the, um, the old Hollywood actress Marilyn Monroe as someone who has a very breathy voice. Okay, so um, there's, these can be sort of permanent vocal settings. Um, both breathy and creaky are not considered terribly efficient by the speech pathologists, okay? So um, we don't, yeah, we don't really uh, like to have them as permanent states. And in languages that use breathy or creaky voice, it tends to be just on selected syllables to contrast with modal voicing or, or so on, okay? Um, in, in English and in many, many languages, we don't use it to change the meaning of a word, but we use it pragmatically. Often creaky voice we use to signal the end of an utterance, okay, um, to show that we've finished our turn. Uh, turn. Okay, I'm exaggerating there a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's a slowing down uh, of the vocal folds, and it, so it tends to be associated with a very low pitch, creaky voice does. Um, so, uh, if you really listen carefully, you can hear, hear every little pulse, okay? Normally the vocal folds are vibrating, for me, normally about, they're opening and closing 200, about 200 times a second, all right? That's not the, um, with, with creaky voice, uh, for me, it would be dropping into a much, much lower pitch range. I'm not really sure how low, I'm gonna say 150, 120 times a second, it might be opening and closing, all right? And it's irregular, it's, it's not really perfectly, um, regular like modal voicing is, okay. Um, so another inefficient form of vocal fold vibration. Um, and down at the very end, we've got um, uh, what we call the glottal stop. And this is uh, another glottal consonant, um, like this. 
okay? And this, um, I did it in slanty brackets up there, never mind. Um, this is uh, the sound that you, it, it is complete closure of the vocal folds, complete. Okay. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, you can feel that, hear that catch. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, so it's in a, like a many dialects of, um, well, some dialects of English, in a word like butter, instead of butter, um, you put butter on your bread, so I would say butter, and that sound in the middle is uh, the glottal, okay, um, and it's often, <laughs> often vowels have like a glottal stop at the beginning, if I just go ah, uh, that had a nice glottal stop, ah. Uh, all right, so we tend to sort of ignore this kind of um, sound. Um, it's sort of that closure before the voicing begins. Okay, um, and I just realised that I forgot to write. Um, so we've got the glottal, this is the voiceless at the other end, uh, the voiceless glottal consonant. Um, this one is also voiced, voiceless, sorry, it's a stop. But we also have um, another glottal consonant that I didn't write, which is this this is the breathy voiced one, okay, that I wrote up here for the, um, for the breathy voiced uh, stop over here. It can be a consonant in its own right. Typically in the middle of a word, um, if we say aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, it's a little bit more heading towards the voicing side of H. So this is a voiced H, if you like, all right. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to um, go into um, a couple of things I need to warn you about. Um, the first one is, as English speakers, uh, you probably don't really hear this um, distinction between pa, ba, and ba, okay? So I just want to warn you that there is this sort of voice in continuum. Here's pa, here's ba, and here's ba. A pa, a ba, a ba, okay? Um, now this is a three-way contrast that can be quite challenging for um, native speakers of European languages. Um, well, native speakers of many languages, okay. Now, can I say to you that what you know in English as the letter P is somewhere in between a pa and a ba. And what you know in English as the letter B is somewhere in between a pa and a ba. Okay. Um, so, um, Many of you, if I say a ba, you probably hear it as the letter B. Most of the time in English, this is what our um, letter B is. And most of the time in English, our letter P is this aspirated. Okay. Um, however, if you happen to be an Italian speaker, <laughs> most of the time your B is uh, actually properly voiced and your letter P is... Um, voice is unaspirated. So this is a real contrast that you need to practice. Um, to a pa, a ba, a ba. And you practice it by your fingers on the throat. A ba, okay. Um, and a ba, a ba, a pa. And the puff of air in front, the big puff of air for a pa, less of a puff of air for a ba. And that just takes a bit of practice, all right. In English, um, our letter P is aspirated most of the time, especially in um, stressed syllables and at the beginnings of words like pin. Um, but um, uh, it, it might not be quite as aspirated, say, in the middle of a word in an unstressed syllable like dapper or dipper, all right? Um, it wouldn't be quite as aspirated, okay? Our letter B, would tend to be um, much more, uh, uh, well, it would t our letter B would tend to be more like the letter P at the beginning of a word like banana. You really wouldn't have much vo voicing on the letter B for banana. Just feel that. You really wouldn't have the voicing. But if you said something like ABBA, ABBA, as in the 1970s pop supergroup, that one Eurovision, um, ABBA, then you're really looking at something that's uh, more properly voiced. It's between two vowels and vowels are normally voiced. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's that one. Um, so we, we say that English 
is um, an aspiration language. It's not aspirational, um, <laughs> it's just um, aspiration language, e.g. English, okay, um, or, and, and most Germanic languages in fact, all right. And then we also talk about um, uh, true voicing languages, which would be like voice, uh, true voicing languages. Okay. Um, and that would be like Italian. And in fact, most Romance languages. Okay. So um, true voicing languages has a two-way contrast. Um, we, we, here we're talking about languages that have a two-way two -way contrast, okay, in their stop consonants. Um, so Italian true voicing would contrast b and p, and aspiration would contrast b and p, okay. Uh, true voicing ba, ba, uh, and aspiration ba, pa, okay. So this is um, a real challenge for um, many students of phonetics. Okay, um, so this is, a, like I say, a two-way contrast, but you can also get, and I'll just write that in pink, a three-way voicing contrast. Three-way contrast, pa, ba, and ba. And that would be a language for like um, Thai. Many languages have this kind of contrast, okay? Um, but Thai is the famous one. Um, I don't speak Thai, but I've been told that if I say, um, uh, ba depends on my tone, which I'm very. Uh, I'm, I didn't. I'm not going to worry about that. But ba means um, a shoulder. Ba means forest, and pa means to split in Thai. I've been told. Um, so uh, that's quite different to the two-way system we have in the European languages. Okay. You can also get a four-way voicing contrast. And that would be pa, ba, ba, and the, um, the breathy voiced ba, okay. Um, and that tends to be especially in the um, Indian languages like Hindi, okay. Uh, you do get that four-way voicing contrast. All right, um, so we're talking about the languages of Asia really when we're going... <laughs> Yeah, usually talking about Asian languages when we're talking about three-way and four-way contrasts, okay. But um, yeah, so this is the voicing continuum, the ideal states we use for linguistics. It's a little bit simplified. Um, the, the speech pathologist would really distinguish many more glottal states than we do in linguistics. And even in linguistics, we're starting to recognise that there are more voice qualities that are used contrastively in languages that might have a harsh voice setting or so on. But these are the ones we traditionally think of, okay? Um, in terms of, you know, the, the um, voicing, we have breathy, voiced and creaky on the sonorants, on the vowels and the nasals and the laterals. And then for the obstruents, um, especially the stops, but to a lesser extent, not, not quite so, yeah, mainly stops, we have the aspirated, um, the, the voiceless, regular voiced and, uh, and uh, aspirated, voiceless, breathy voiced and voiced. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, as I say, um, vocal fold vibration is quite complex um, from speech pathology point of view. So I've just been doing this for open and closed, Ugh. open, closed, open, closed. Um, but in fact, if you have different views of the vocal folds, they can be they're sort of doing all sorts of motions at the same time. They're sort of opening and closing at the same time, but if you have a, a front-on view, um, they're going like this as well. So it's really quite complex. Um, but thank you, that's a um, basic overview of the laryngeal states that feeds into everything that's above the larynx.